evening, friends. Welcome to this Tuesday evening uh, critical care um, uh, CME programs uh, by both uh, Yasoda Hospitals and ISSM Hyderabad chapter. We try to bring some of these uh, uh, debated topics and uh, the areas where many of our clinicians want to know more and learn. So today we have an opportunity and privilege to have uh, Dr. Ramraz Gopalan, sir, who has been our inspiration teacher and a seasoned speaker in many of the conferences where we look after him for those academic sessions. Sir, it is our privilege and honor to have you here, sir. Welcome you. Thank you. So uh, what happened over the last uh, two couple of weeks, we had an opportunity to actually listen to one of his lectures uh, in uh, the Madurai. So we felt uh, he, he has been externally brilliant in explaining me that, uh, and I felt like the core student um, in a medical school. So I felt he should be uh, doing that for all of us. So we requested him. It's um, always um, uh, uh, what's a happening things to actually have him as a faculty and a teacher. So I request Dr. Ramraz Gopalan sir to take us through right heart and a role of intensivist in managing it. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Vankar Raman. Um, the, uh, the talk that I'm going to give, is, as you said, was something that I'd given at a workshop. So it may be a little differently structured from what you would expect, but I'm pretty certain that we will cover a lot of areas that will be probably reasonably effective from your perspective also. Okay, the focus on right ventricle, the way I have structured my lecture is uh, the initial part. I'm, I'm, I'm warning you, and because you're all at home, you can take the appropriate uh, preventative measures. Uh, it will be a little bit on the boring side. It's going to be a pure physiology discussion. Then after that, I will go on to the use of the echo uh, dominantly as a bedside tool for the assessment of RV function. And depending on the kind of time that we have also, I will in initiate the discussion about the treatment of RV dysfunction and probably uh, maybe very superficially, but we're always open to any kind of questions. Uh, the way I've structured it, this lecture, again, warning again, may go on for about an hour or more than an hour. So uh, whatever you need to do to prepare for this, uh, please go ahead and go ahead and uh, make sure that you're comfortable. Okay, with that in the background, it has always been a problem for us to regard anything about the left heart, I mean, about the right heart, primarily because we always think of the heart's single purpose is to pump blood, okay? Or in other words, uh, this is basically what William Harvey wrote in 1628. And we sort of have, you know, this idea has been promoted that we look at it completely, the circulation as a cardiocentric kind of a phenomenon in which the left ventricle is the dominant kind of a structure. This again has been promoted prominently in the cardiology literature when you look at it by very influential people. In 1940s, there was a guy called, um, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Starr, who was a very strong uh, opinion maker. And effectively, what he did was he took an animal experiment in which he cauterized the entire right heart and showed that it didn't affect the hemodynamics in, in, the, in these animals under unstressed kind of a states. So it sort of reduced the value of the right ventricle further by calling it a, just a vein with a, you know, what we can call it a vein with an attitude if they wanted to call it that. Okay. And it was thought as nothing more than a passive conduit for the passage of blood. And this again is probably been re-emphasized re again, if you look at the, uh, the development of the right heart catheter, which could effectively look at all the parameters on the right heart. It was invented primarily to you know, bypass the right heart. We look at things like the wedge uh, pressure on the which is a right, left-sided filling pressure, okay? More than anything that we look at in terms of the right heart pressures when you use the PA catheter. And this sort of focuses our entire attention towards one direction alone, okay? But we have to remember for the heart to pump blood, it needs to receive the blood. And you can't just believe that this receipt of the blood can be related to just the heart pushing out the blood from itself, that it goes into the circulation and returns back to the heart. It is probably not true because the heart probably needs to work actively to get the blood back. And this has been very classically termed as what you call vis atargo and vis affronte in the old textbooks of physiology. But I think this is something that we never got very clearly, where we thought that all that mattered was how the heart put out blood 
but we didn't focus on the heart, you know, receiving the blood again. Remember, the heart is not a suction apparatus, so it doesn't, you know, create a negative pressure for the blood to come in. But on the other hand, Guyton was the one who brought the entire idea of the importance of venous return in determining the cardiac output. And uh, this graph may be a little too complex to look at it, but effectively what it is trying to show is that the venous return curve that I'm plotting over here, okay, is going to be what is going to determine the ultimate output of the heart, okay? And I'll explain this a little clearly. Uh, if you look at it, venous return is created by a differential pressure between what we call the, um, the what is the, the systemic filling pressure, which is basically the filling of your venous uh, capacitance vessels peripherally by the blood that generates a positive pressure. That pressure should be in excess of the right atrial pressure for the venous return to occur. And the larger this difference between the right atrial pressure and the and the median um, and the uh, the average systemic filling pressure, the greater the amount of blood that is going to return to the heart and the greater the amount of cardiac function that is going to be generated, cardiac output that is going to be generated. And this is quite important, and I'm re-summarizing it over here, saying that when you have blood in the capacitance vessels in the periphery, it generates a, because of the elastic recoil of these vessels, it generates a positive pressure at the periphery. This pressure is not usually very high, but if the right atrial pressure can be kept as values lower than the systemic filling pressure, it will guarantee that the venous return will occur, and that will be the one that will determine the output of the heart ultimately. And I think this is an idea that is completely the reverse of what we all think. And in that sense, since the right atrial pressure is the minor, the major determinant of the return of, of blood, we need to understand this is where the right ventricular, uh, the right heart becomes a very important structure. The primary role of the right ventricle is to function as this receiving chamber. And the way in which it functions as this receiving chamber is by keeping the right atrial pressures sufficiently low so that it can maximize the venous return. And this is done by one of two processes. There are anatomical features of the right ventricle that guarantee that these pressures are low. There is also functional processes that can guarantee that these pressures remain low. And I'll try to explain some of them at least. Remember, the right ventricle is shaped like what you call a hemi-ellipsoid which is wrapped around a cylindrical left ventricle. But most importantly, the right ventricular wall is extremely thin. And as a consequence, that high compliance of that right ventricular wall allows it to accommodate a large volume of blood, even with variation of blood volume, without any significant rise in the pressures. So the right-sided pressures are remain low, primarily because you have an extremely compliant right ventricular wall. The second thing also is the geometric peculiarity of the right ventricle. It has a huge, what you call a surface area to volume ratio, and you can really put in large volumes of blood without creating major stress, okay, major stretch on the ventricle. And this is probably very important so that it doesn't generate a very high pressure even when it is filled with large volumes of blood. Secondarily, the, the right heart pumps into the pulmonary vascular bed which is also a hugely compliant, low pressure kind of a system. So if you really look at it, the entire right heart is structured in a way that it is effectively a very low pressure system. Additionally, when you look at it functionally also, the right heart is distinctly different from the left heart. Uh, I, I hope you understand the pressure volume curves. The pressure volume curves are basically a representation of the amount of work that is being done by each one of these ventricles. Let me just get my... Uh, my pointer over here, yeah. Okay, so if you look at the left ventricular pressure uh, volume curve, the amount of work that is being done in the left ventricle is several times what you would see in the RV. As I said over here, the RV generates only about, uh, requires only about one sixth of the energy as, as the LV to eject the same volume of blood. This is between diastole and systole. The same amount of blood is being ejected by both the left ventricle and the right ventricle. 
The difference between the left and the right ventricle is the left ventricle tries to generate a high pressure because the systemic filling pressures are very high. And much of the work is generated to the generation of this, this pressure that needs to keep the blood in circulation. In contrast to that, the right ventricular work is dominantly to cause the blood flow to occur, basically occurring in a compliant, low resistant pulmonary circulation where the systemic resistance is almost 10 times what you see in the pulmonary vascular uh, resistance. And that is probably a very important part that we need to understand. So both anatomically and physiologically, the right heart is meant to have a very low pressure which will guarantee that the systemic filling pressures will be sufficiently high and there will be a venous return that will occur to the right ventricle. And this is going to be the most important aspect of it. Now, we need to ask ourselves, so how does the right heart fail? If we are like most of our cardiologist colleagues, and for that matter, most of us, the way we think, when we think of heart failing, we think of it as primarily a myocardial dysfunction of some kind. So dominantly, something like a right ventricular infarct will be the main reason for heart failure. But we very rarely think about the other components of volume overloading and pressure overloading, which can seriously occur in the right heart failure. You can add volume overloading with, say, for instance, tricuspid regurgitation, which can cause a large amount of blood to come back into the heart. And you can have pressure overloading classically with pulmonary hypertension or even pulmonary emboli. And this is also relatively important. Now, let's look at this as we would normally look at it and say, what about myocardial dysfunction? Okay, now the right heart contracts distinctly different from the way in which the left heart contracts. Most of us understand how the left heart contracts. It's classically a circumferential uh, a reduction in its, in its uh, cross-sectional area. And there will be some degree of shortening from the apex to the, uh, to the base. But dominantly, it's a, a, a contraction that occurs by cylindrical, uh, I mean, by what circumferential reduction in its uh, volume. In contrast to that, the right ventricle has both a combination of some degree of approximation of the free wall towards the septum. But probably more importantly, the number two component that I'm demonstrating over here is probably far more relevant, which is the shortening of the right ventricle. So if I was to look at it in an echocardiogram I was showing you, between diastole and systole, it is not so much the approximation of the wall that matters, it is very clearly the shortening that matters, okay? And for a long time, we believe that this occurred because of the orientation of the right ventricular fibers. We believe that the right ventricular fibers are dominantly oriented in a longitudinal direction in contrast to the circumferential orientation of the uh, left ventricular fibers. And we always thought that this is the way in which the right heart will contract. Okay, now let's go back to the, the, the studies that I talked about. Starr did this study where he basically cauterized the entire right ventricular wall. Okay, and what he found was in an unstressed kind of a situation, he did not change the cardiac output at all. Okay, and if you look at it, even in patients who have right ventricular infarcts, if they have an isolated right ventricular infarct, they very rarely have any associated significance in, in terms of the symptoms. Okay, uh, but, but that is, so if uh, inferior wall MI occurs, less than 10% have a shock. Okay, so that very clearly seems to imply that you can tolerate a muscle, uh, right ventricular muscle dysfunction quite significantly. And this is again, you know, if you take the other example, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Fontan procedure, which is used usually in patients with either a right heart atresia or significant tricuspid stenosis, where they don't have any way of getting the blood into the right ventricle. So under those conditions, there have been a procedure where you do a cavo pulmonary anastomosis, effectively bypassing the right heart. And these patients actually do pretty well. They live into their late 40s quite effectively, unless you put them through some degree of stress. Either you take them to very high altitudes or through, uh, or you know, create a left ventricular problem on them. They usually tolerate this kind of a procedure. Again, both of this strongly implying that the muscular activity of the right heart is probably relatively unimportant. So the question that we will always ask is, how does the right heart continue to put out the blood okay, when its muscular function is not so important at all? And in that, I think we need to understand this concept of interdependence. 
the interdependence may be described as an instantaneous change in the function of one ventricle when a change occurs in the other, not mediated through any neural, humoral, or circulatory process. Okay, these are in series mechanisms. When the right heart fails, the left heart drops its output. When the left heart fails, the right heart drops its output. And that is what we call as an interdependence. And for a while, we didn't understand the importance of this interdependence in terms of right ventricular contractility. Now, there were studies that were done, and I, I'm just going to show you this very superficially. The two ways in which it's been done is uh, classically in, in, uh, in studies in which you have a left ventricular uh, assist device of some kind, and you can monitor the hemodynamics, both of the right and left heart in a cat lab. You can demonstrate that when you ab abruptly change your left ventricular filling in one way, it in instantly affects your right ventricular pressures also at the same time. And this suggests that there is some kind of a systolic interdependence between the right and the left ventricle chamber. If the left ventricle performs poorly, the right ventricle also performs poorly. This is further interestingly you know, studied in a different way in which you can you know, pace the right and left heart independently. Okay, and by doing that, or by separating the duration of RA, uh, you know, RARB pacing versus uh, uh, the left ventricular pacing, you can probably differentiate between how much of the pressure in the right heart is generated by right ventricular contraction versus left ventricular contraction. And in this, it is very, very interesting. While the left ventricle, as we expect, is less affected by this kind of interdependence, where 95% of the left ventricular output is because of left ventricular muscle activity itself. The right ventricle is distinctly different. Roughly only two thirds of its output is determined by left ventricular function, not by right ventricular function. And the contribution of the right ventricular contractility itself is about one third. There may be a little difference in the estimates. Some people will say typically closer to 40%, will be the typical kind of a range. But whatever it is, a significant amount of the right ventricular output is contributed to by the left ventricular contractility. And that is an idea that we need to get into our heads very, very clearly. Because, okay, because it shares an interventricular septum, okay? And probably that is the mechanism that I will try and explain the idea behind septal interdependence. If you look at MRI studies, it very clearly shows you that the left and the right ventricle share a lot of fibers, not just in the septum, but also on their free walls. And effectively, these two chambers, even though they are anatomically distinct, they're probably from a muscle kind of a point of view, one combined entity that if you affect one of them, the other will be strongly affected. Okay. And along those lines, the way we understood the shortening of the right ventricle was completely wrong. While it is absolutely true that the right ventricle here demonstrated in blue may contract to some extent by the circumferential fibers that are present, which will result in an approximation of the free wall to the septum. Okay, And this will only generate about 20% of the output. In contrast to that, most of the left ventricular output is due to the septal contraction, which interestingly is a longitudinal shortening of the septum, which is created by these kinds of oblique fibers that run in the ventricle. We always think of the muscle of the left ventricle as something that is circumferential. It is not. It is oblique in its direction. And because of the obliqueness of this direction, it not only will cause a circumferential shortening, there will also be a shortening along the longitudinal axis. And this is the reason that the right ventricle is able to generate a lot of its output through the septal uh, you know, uh, interdependence that it has. And this is quite important for us to understand. Okay, And once we understand this, we probably will understand a lot of the issues related to uh, RV failure and its interdependence. Well, I, I was trying to be very simplistic about my explanation of interdependence by saying it is a shared muscle and the direction of the muscle fibers that make a difference. But there are also other issues related to, say, the position of the interventricular septum at end systole that can seriously affect the way in which the two chambers can have interdependence. 
Likewise, it's the tension on the on the walls also that is very important. It is very important to recognize if I, if I stretch one wall, I'm likely to create changes in the tension, not only of the right ventricular P-wall, but I'll also probably cause changes in the septum and in the left ventricular P-wall or the other way around. Right ventricular free wall, the septum, and the left ventricular free wall. Okay, it's like this kind of interdependence really makes it very difficult for you to differentiate the two. And very clearly, the right ventricle doesn't contract by its free wall contraction alone. It contracts or ejects blood dominantly through its septal interaction. And that is quite important for us to recognize. So, given that the contractile function of the RV free wall contributes very minimally to the right heart failure. The main way in which the right heart failure occurs is by two other mechanisms. Very clearly, since the left heart is a dominating factor in terms of the ejection, if there is combined left heart failure in a patient with right heart failure, they will be compromised. The other situation in which the compromise can occur is in patients with significant pulmonary vascular uh, changes that increase the pulmonary afterload. And this is also very important for us to understand. Okay, and very, very clearly, uh, this is very interesting because if you look at the commonest causes of, of uh, right heart failure in, in chronically managed patients, it is associated left ventricular failure. Okay, we always think of it as a nice back pressure alone, or if left heart doesn't put out, the right heart will not put out. But we also forget that that interdependence, okay, is going to be a very strong factor that will determine why the right heart also fails. Likewise, the pulmonary afterload is definitely a far more important concern for us. As you can see over here, when you increase the pulmonary vascular pressures by, or the afterload, okay, in the right ventricle, and compare it with what happens when the systemic artery pressures are rising for the left ventricle, much smaller changes. Remember, this is 10, 20, 30. This is 110, 120, 130, quite different kind of scales that you're seeing. The way in which the right heart responds to the, the change in your, uh, um, your, uh, your uh, right heart afterload is very distinctly different from the way in which the left heart will respond. Or in other words, the right heart is extremely intolerant of a afterload rise or a PA pressure rise that can be very common in most of our patients in the intensive care unit. We underappreciate the importance of, uh, of the right, I mean, of the pulmonary hypertension in terms of generating hemodynamic dysfunction. Remember, all the conditions that I'm listing over here, and I've tried very hard not to look at the chronic conditions, are very typical of what we will see. Pulmonary embolism, will increase your pulmonary systolic pressures, can increase your afterload. ARDS can cause vasoconstriction, which can cause an increase in your pulmonary afterload. Mechanical ventilation, particularly the older methods that we use, okay? For instance, uh, when we were using the old tidal volumes of 10 cc's or 12 cc's per kg body weight, okay? We were creating a huge amount of distension of the alveoli, which will compress the intra, uh, I mean, uh, the, what is called the, uh, intrapulmonary ves vessels and effectively will cause a rise in your systemic pressures. This is pretty well documented. Uh, in the old days, when we were ventilating most of our patients with uh, large tidal volumes in, in ARDS, for instance, about one half of patients with severe ARDS would have right heart failure. Right now, if you really look at it, the numbers have dramatically come down when you're using the lower tidal volume. So it does become very important to rec recognize this. Sepsis can account for it. And as we said, left ventricular failure through its interdependence can cause a major kind of a change. We always think only the cardiologists will think only of the right ventricular infarction. Yes, we can't completely ignore it, but usually right ventricular infarction becomes significant only if there is an associated left ventricular failure or significant pulmonary hypertension at the same time. So broadly, a lot of what we deal with in the ICU can potentially increase your afterload and make the right ventricle completely intolerant. And recognizing this is going to be extremely important because when the right heart fails from pulmonary hypertension, the blood stagnates on the right side, there's right ventricular volume increase, okay? In the left heart, there is usually a good response to the increase in volume. You have your Frank Starling mechanism, which will actually cause, it's called heterometric uh, autoregulation as we want to use as a word. Okay, 
And usually with a flank stalling mechanism, when the ventricle is distended, it's going to increase its cardiac output because the contractility will improve. But strangely, because the right ventricle is constructed in a way that it doesn't stretch as much when you increase the volume, okay, this kind of frank stalling mechanism becomes completely attenuated in patients who have right ventricular failure. So the classic characterization of right ventricular failure will be typically on the echocardiogram, for instance, the evaluation, the existence of a right heart dilation. And also, as I said, since the ventricular interdependence and the shortening are very much dependent on the left ventricular contractility, we can look at the longitudinal shortening of the RB on a point of care ultrasound. That will be another marker, both of which I will talk about it okay, a little later. This is just to put the physiology in perspective when you're looking at how you uh, assess right heart function. Okay, now another factor is when the right heart starts distending and starts filling up, since it is restrained in a pericardial cavity, any increase in the right heart pressure can cause a deformation of your, uh, effectively of your left ventricular geometry. And the left ventricular geometry can actually go in a direction that can compromise the left ventricular output. This is not a systolic phenomenon. This is what occurs during diastole and the filling of the ventricle. This is also known as what we call as diastolic interdependence. Just to show it a little bit more physiologically, if you look at left ventricular pressures through a cardiac cycle, okay, you know the typical characteristics in diastole, the pressures are nearly the CVP kind of ranges, low, low ranges. And the right vent and the left, this is the left ventricular pressure is going to be equivalent to your, your aortic pressure and your systemic uh, uh, systolic pressures, okay? But we know that when you look at the right ventricle through the entire cycle, virtually in every stage, whether it's systole or diastole, the right ventricular pressures are always lower than the left ventricular pressures. So when you look at the anatomy of the, of the septum, the septum is going to bulge into the right ventricle in all stages because the pressure within the left is generally larger than the pressure within the right. And that is the typical nature of what you will see in terms of your cardiac uh, cross-sectional areas. In contrast to that, when you develop pulmonary hypertension, at least in the initial phases, your pulmonary pressures start approximating or exceeding the right ventricular pressures in diastole. Okay either in late systole, early diastole, and maybe later it can become a very significant portion of most of diastole, okay? And that will cause another mechanism to occur. Since the right-sided pressures now exceed the left-sided pressures, the septum can get pushed towards the ventricle, towards the left ventricle, and that kind of flattening is a very classic feature of the septal kinetics that occurs, and the diastolic interdependence that is occurring also at the same time. So let me just show you with that how it will look on the echo. And I, echo, I think, dramatically improves the way in which we appreciate the importance of the right heart. Okay. We have a lot of methods that we can use. Let's just look at the, the basic issues. If I want to assess my right ventricular size, okay, or right ventricular distension, we usually make it as a comparison with the left ventricular size, what we call as an RB-LB ratio. That can be the first thing that we measure. The second thing that we measure is we look at RV shortening, okay, or the shortening of the fibers, which I said is the dominant way in which the left right ventricle contracts. You can look at it in terms of what is called the TAPC or the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. I'll come back to that explanation. Or if you have a little bit more skills, you can do a tissue Doppler to assess the same thing. The third thing that we need to look at is your septal flattening, okay, as we said the short axis view showing it, pushing in of your septum towards the left side is a strong predictor. These three may be considered as qualitative predictors of right ventricular dysfunction. Okay, clearly the first thing is the RV becoming larger. Second, the interdependence becoming poorer with the RV shortening actually becoming less and the septal flattening that occurs at the same time of a diastolic interdependence. And these are the three issues. But we also need to assess the, the levels of systemic, I mean, of uh, pulmonary artery pressures that we have. And we have the ability to measure minimum of a CVP. And maybe if you're a little bit more skilled, we can look at PA pressures. 
both the systolic and the diastolic, both of which I will explain a little bit more. Now, let's look at the RV dimensions. Very typically, when you're looking at LV uh, dimensions, we look at cross-sectional areas and we will say that a heart is contracting well if there is a narrowing of the LV cross-sectional area, okay? And we generally will find that it is a reasonable correlate with the ejection fraction of the left ventricle. This does not happen in the RV because the RV is not a uniform structure. Here I'm demonstrating the anatomical structure of the RV. As you notice over here, it is quite a different shape. And you can't look at one cross-sectional area and predict the volumes or the change in volumes, which will be the way in which you can judge the RV ejection fraction. So it is actually very poor. Okay. The second thing is the right heart is sometimes under the sternum and even under the best of conditions, you may not have such a lovely, I mean, assessment of the right ventricular uh, chamber adequately, and you may not be able to mess, uh, I mean, measure these volumes very effectively. And generally, what we will say is don't look at the volumes in the way we look at it in a left heart failure. On the other hand, we can do what are simpler processes, which is compare the RV dimensions with the LV dimension. Okay, what we call a relative RV dimension, and all of us can do this. Okay, it's a as I say, when you look at the green happy face over there, it's an implication that it's an easy skill that anybody can acquire. If you can get a reasonable quality four chamber apical view, you can easily make a comparison between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. If the left ventricle classically is twice the size of the right ventricle, a little larger, it is normal. The right ventricle should be less than half, I mean, roughly less than half, but never more than 0.6. If it is more than 0.6, we consider it as basically right ventricular distension. If the volumes are exactly identical, the ratio of one, it is what we consider as severe dilation. And this is what we call as your RV, LV area ratios. Theoretically, you can eyeball it. Uh, most of us do, but you can also you know, generate the areas in the cross section and make a true comparison of the two. Okay, so one uh, classic error that I will see is if you're going to do something like that, make sure that the location of your, uh, that you know how to get a good four chamber view. As you see on the right, this is a great four chamber view. We have, okay, uh, nice ventricles, nice atria, inter the atrioventricular valves are visible. The septum is beautifully in midline. Okay, in contrast to that, this is a classically foreshortened view, which you can get if you place your echo probe in the wrong direction or a little too far away from the apex. Okay, and in this, again, you can get a false value. Here, it looks like the right ventricle is looking a little larger than the left ventricle, which may be just purely from a function of foreshortening. Be very careful when you're looking at comparative volumes. The second thing that we look at, as we said, is to look at the apical shortening. And I'm showing you over here, the right ventricle in systole is generally longer than, I mean, in, in diastole, is generally longer than what you see in systole. And if we can measure the distance between the apex and the tricuspid valve annulus, okay, usually on the free wall, okay, you can get a measure of the extent of this shortening. And that is what we call as TAPC or the tricuspid annular phase systolic excursion. Okay, so what you will see over here is you put an M mode over here between the uh, apex and the and the uh, tricuspid valve. Not not a great echo, I will have to say. And you will see that the the tricuspid valve annulus is moving sequentially, and the distance between what is it at systole and diastole will give you the TAPC. Typically, that is about 18 millimeters, 1.8 centimeters, and a low value of anything less than 1.5 centimeters is considered as being abnormal, okay? Remember, if you do it correctly, the inter-observer reproducibility is excellent, okay? And image quality need not be very great. Even with the average image quality, we seem to have excellent reproducibility. So the TAPC is a definite factor. If you want to look at it a little bit more sophisticated, okay, instead of looking at the TAPC, okay, at the same site, if you put a tissue Doppler, you can estimate the velocity of the movement of the tricuspid annulus towards the apex. And you can do what is called a measurement of your 
systolic velocity or the S, S, S prime, as you see, the systolic velocity under these conditions will be towards the probe. These are the diastolic velocity, your E and your A prime that we use for other reasons, for diastolic properties. And this is a systolic property change that can be used as a measure like the TAPSI of the effic efficacy of the shortening. And that is quite important for you to get that. If you look at the preferred indices, as we say, TAPSI and the S prime are considered as reasonably feasible kind of uh, measures. The FAC or the fractional area change is very subject to uh, errors. And generally, I don't consider that as very reasonable. And this is usually not done in an ICU. So if you're going to look at RV function in terms of anything, you look at the TAPSI and you can look at the S prime if you want it. Again, and as I said, when you say RV function, I mean dominantly the ventricular interdependence that you have. The next aspect we said was look at the septal kinetics. Over here on the left, you can see very, very clearly a normal septal kinetics where the ventricular dimension of the chamber is come constantly, I mean, always concentric, both in systole and diastole. And the interventricular septum is bulging into the, into the uh, right ventricle. When there is a diastolic pressure that is high enough that it can cause a deformation, this is what happens. Effectively, there is a flattening of your interventricular septum. And the greater the extent of the flattening, it can go into a convexity also. But it's a good measure to, to use what is called an eccentricity index. So basically, you're looking at the one, the longest axis and comparing it with the shortest axis and getting a ratio. Okay. But that is again for. But one of the classic errors that I always get when people tell me about septal flattening is sometimes uh, they don't know how to put the probe. You, you in a longitudinal, in a long axis, you direct the probe towards the, I mean, the marker towards the right shoulder. And when you turn 90 degrees towards the opposite shoulder, you get a cross-sectional area. Sometimes people do an incomplete kind of a turn and get hybrid views which if you look at it, looks like some kind of a short a flattening of the septum. Very typically, my, when my uh, juniors will call up and say, septal flattening, sir, the next thing that I will ask is, is there any evidence of right ventricular pressure rise? The most easy thing that you can do is to look at, well, skip that, is to look at your IBC dimensions. And uh, I, I will not go through the methodology that I will use, but effectively with the IVC dimensions, what you're going to be seeing is if there is a significant respiratory variation in a patient who is breathing spontaneously. Okay, so as you see over here, if somebody said there is septal flattening, I would expect that my right atrial pressure will also be high. And in other words, basically in contrast to, uh, oops, I'm having a problem there. Okay, in contrast to a, IBC that will collapse completely, the IBC that doesn't collapse and is probably more distended is an indication that your right-sided pressures are high. You can use a basic set of rules and basically say, if it is smaller than 1.5 and it is collapsing, your CVP is almost close to zero. If it is between one and a half to two and a half and there is greater than 50% collapse, it probably have five, okay? If it is less than 50 with the same kind of dimensions, it's closer to 10. And if it is dilated and the decrease is very small, okay, or no change, it's 15 and 20. These are quite important values because you use this for ultimately assessing your pulmonary artery pressures also. Okay, I will not go through the details of how you measure the pulmonary artery pressure, but the pulmonary artery systolic pressure can be estimated from a knowledge of the, uh, the tricuspid regurgitation that you have. Very simply, uh, you can have tricuspid regurgitation means your, your systolic pressure in the ventricle and your systolic pressure in the atrium will be identical because the, the tricuspid is open during systole. Okay, and the ventricular pressure is the same as your PA systolic pressure. So effectively, by knowing this kind of a, of a flow, you can make an estimate of what the PA pressure is, PA systolic pressure is. And very typically, the way we would do it is get the Doppler, freeze the Doppler, get the maximum velocity, and convert that velocity into a pressure through the 4V squared method. I will not go through the methodology that you need to why, why, how a, a, a velocity can be converted into a pressure. But if you are interested, it's a modified Bernoulli equation that you can always find anywhere you want to. Okay. Now, how good are these pressures? When you look at the estimation of your systolic PA pressure by the echocardiogram, 
it is almost as good as invasive systolic PA pressures obtained by the right heart catheter. And this is a reasonably good kind of correlation. And generally, we find that this is what we will definitely measure. Can we measure other pressures? To measure other pressures, you need a little bit more sophistication in the way in which you look at the pulmonary artery. Very typically, we'll do a cross-sectional view, okay? And in that, we generally don't go beyond the mitral valve. But if you direct your probe a little bit more towards the base, not towards the apex, okay? You will go across a section, I'll just show you this, okay? Where the aortic root is in the middle, the pulmonary trunk is surrounding it, and behind it, there is an association of the, of the right atrium and, and uh, left atrium, which will be behind the aorta, okay? And that you can see on your cross section when you go through this high kind of a cut, okay? And effectively, what you will see there will be the central Mercedes-Benz sign and then you will see the right ventricular outflow tract in front of that, okay? The outflow tract will, if you can identify the pulmonary valves, you can definitely identify the tricuspid valve. So if this is the RV and the RVOT, this becomes the pulmonary artery. And here you will notice will be the, the basically the right atrium and interatrial septum and the left atrium. And this is an important view because this is the way in which we can you know, judge at the pressures that are present in the pulmonary artery. Just to show you another example of the same thing, okay, as you can see over here, there's a beautiful uh, Mercedes-Benz sign, as you call it. When it is closed, the valves, it will become like a Y. When it is open, it will show you a large triangle. This is the aorta. Around the aorta, you can see the pulmonary vascular outflow tract. Okay, you can see the tricuspid valve and therefore the right atrium. The left atrium is there with the inter inter interatrial septum in between. Okay, and this is the classic view. You can put a Doppler across this to try and measure. Okay, oh, I have all of that labeled. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize for that. Okay, so how can you do that? You put a Doppler across the pulmonary uh, across the uh, pulmonary artery, and you can measure your flow. Typically, we don't look at the flow alone. The pulmonary artery flow will be identical to the left ventricular flow. Ultimately, it give you an idea of the cardiac output if you get a pressure time integral. But with, that's not what we look at. We look at number one. We look at the shape of the of the uh, the PA uh, pulmonary artery tracing. If it is classically bifid, it is a suggestion or a bifid or a deformed kind of a PA pressure. It is a strong suggestion that there is moderate pulmonary hypertension. But more importantly, we try to quantitate it by a distinctly different process. So if I was to see this is the the flow that I create uh, that I detect in the pulmonary artery. Okay, I can freeze it and look at these two points, basically the point at which there is the initiation of flow, the point at which the peak flow occurs, and the distance between the two is what we call as an acceleration time. The acceleration time becomes narrower in patients with significant pulmonary hypertension, and it becomes wider in normal kind of conditions. Okay, so typically you and I will have a 100 millisecond or greater kind of a value, the patient with pulmonary hypertension will have less than 80 milliseconds, okay, or even less than 60 milliseconds under certain circumstances. And this acceleration time can be converted into a mean pulmonary artery pressure by a simple formula where you use effectively um, 80 minus acceleration time divided by two. So if there's an acceleration time of 80, 80 divided by two is 40, 80 minus 40 will be 40 millimeters of mercury as your mean uh, PA pressures, okay? But that again is not a great correlate. If you look at the mean PA pressures derived that way and you look at the, the uh, PA catheter, this is completely different from what we saw for the systolic pressures, but we very rarely use this as a method of measurement. Now, when it comes to, so what I've done up to this point in time, I've given you a reasonable idea of the physiology with a strong emphasis that the right ventricular contractility is not so important, but its interdependence both systole and diastole with the left ventricle is extremely important. And the fact that the right heart fails not by the right ventricular muscle fatiguing out acutely, but dominantly by an increase in the afterload or if the left heart itself fails. So I've said that. And then I've gone through the echocardiographic methods that can identify when there is right heart failure 
that is chamber dimension changes and TAPSI kind of variation. And I also said that you can, and of course, yeah, cross-sectional area showing you flattening. And I also said, you can probably measure the PA pressures using the echocardiogram, and that should give you a reasonable idea of what goes on. Remember, right ventricular failure is an extremely diverse condition. While I emphasize the, the right ventricular pressure overload that occurs under acute conditions, acidosis, hypoxia, pulmonary embolism, ARDS, and ventilation, there are a whole range of other conditions, okay, which can affect not only the pressure, but the volume and can affect the, uh, after, I mean, the contractility, both in an acute kind of a situation and in a chronic kind of a situation. For the sake of this lecture, I will say, call your cardiologist if you want to talk about the chronic kind of conditions, but let's just focus on the acute conditions of which we need to know right ventricular myocardial infarction, which will be a right ventricular dimensional change along with, okay, uh, probably uh, a associated left ventricular dysfunction, okay. Uh, then we can look at other conditions like sepsis and the other conditions which will be typical, okay. And this will be the conditions that we need to usually focus our attention to when you are treating the patients. Before we go on to treating of the patients, the classic problem that we will face when we are doing an echocardiogram is since there are both acute and chronic conditions that can lead to the right ventricular failure, one of the first questions that we will ask is, is this patient with something that has been chronic or is this the acuteness of the current event that is creating the right ventricular failure? For this, we have some rules of thumb that we can usually develop. Okay, classically, in a chronic situation, the right ventricular free wall becomes hypertrophic. And a thickening of the right ventricular free wall greater than 0.5 centimeters is a good indication of a chronic chronicity. Otherwise, it's a very thin wall. The second thing also that we need to recognize is in chronic conditions, the ability to generate or to tolerate extremely high PA systolic pressures is there. A acute pulmonary embolism will not usually tolerate very high systolic pressures. Okay, so when you see a PA systolic that is greater than 60 millimeters of mercury, or when you see a pulmonary acceleration time that suggests that there is some accommodation, that it is not as severe as it should be, I said lower values are usually greater, greater than 60, this would imply that there is a chronic kind of a condition rather than an acute kind. And as I said, since left ventricular hypertrophy is also something that can occur because of the chronic condition, if you see LV hypertrophy along with RV hypertrophy and the 60-60 in the opposite direction, greater than 60, greater than 60 on this, you probably would suggest that this is a chronic kind of a situation. RV infarctions can be identified by associated LV kind of changes. The one problem that we probably, that is, yeah, 60-60 sign. One problem that we we'll usually face is in the diagnosis and pulmonary embolism. Why is this important? Because it has a clear-cut prognostication idea. So in a patient who is normotensive and who doesn't have right ventricular failure, mortality is significantly lower than if you develop right, right heart failure. And therefore, the assessment of right heart function in a patient with pulmonary embolism becomes extremely important. It is a very important aspect of decision-making. But you have to remember that the echo is not a great test for the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, particularly in hemodynamically stable patients. In hemodynamically unstable patients who probably cannot go for a CT angiogram or anything, you can use certain parameters of severe right heart failure as a method of identifying pulmonary embolism, of which the, these three signs, uh, these two signs are important, the 60-60 and the McConnell sign. And it is very important to realize that in the standard transthoracic echo, you will not find emboli. Okay, so don't say I don't see an embolus, therefore it can't be a pulmonary embolism. Nor can you make a diagnosis very easily in hemodynamically stable kind of situation. Just let me show you the, these two factors. I will not go through this, but basically remember just to show you the 60-60 rule in a pulmonary embolism. Okay, if you have a tricuspid regurgitation, okay, that is over here that is less than 60, that is typically acute pulmonary embolism. Also, if your activation time is less than 60, it is compatible with a acute pulmonary embolism, the 60-60 sign. Okay, if you combine it with McConnell, it claims to have very good specificity 
but not so great sensitivity. Okay, so if you don't see it, it doesn't mean you've ruled out pulmonary embolism. But if you do see it, the possibility that that's pulmonary embolism is reasonably high. This is the identification of the mechanical sign. As you notice, this is the left ventricle and the left atrium, the right atrium and the right ventricle. The right ventricle is looking larger than the left ventricle, suggesting pulmonary hypertension. But what is very interesting is if you look at the right ventricular wall, you can see that up here, there is a preservation of contractility, whereas down here, the contractility is not so good. This apical preservation of contractility is what is called the mechanical sign. This will show you that beaking that you're seeing. You want to show it graphically. Okay, what you see in chronic pulmonary hypertension will be all the chambers, the, the, uh, the contractility is going to be very poor. Okay, but all, uh, I mean, all across the ventricle. But what you see in acute pulmonary embolism is a preservation of your apical contractility, which is a little unusual. Okay. But yeah, despite the fact that people claim that it's got high specificity, uh, I think there is some doubts. The most recent data actually doesn't put the specificity very high. So really, it's very difficult to completely diagnose a pulmonary embolism, even in a hemodynamically compromised patient. But uh, sometimes we will have to make a guess. Importantly, as we said, since TAPC is a good indicator of the interdependence, and if there is going to be a loss of uh, interdependence in a pulmonary embolism, it is very likely that this will translate into a declining TAPC, and that has a predictive value in most of these patients. TAPC and the RBLB ratio has also got predictive value in septic patients. The outcomes are generally poorer if patients have both a enlargement of the RB and a decline in the TAPC. Okay, and uh, that is associated with the highest possible mortality. As you see in the independent uh, predictors of mortality on a ventilated patient, not only the SOPA score or the TAPC in the right ventricular uh, dimension, but also the PPLAT becomes a very independent kind of a predictor. Uh, it's also a value in prognostication in ARDS. I will not uh, do it. But let's just come back and say, how does a patient who has pulmonary hypertension get worse and die? Here again, we have to appeal to the brilliance of Arthur, Arthur C. Guyton, okay, who did the original work related to pulmonary hypertension. What he did in this situation was he put a clamp on the, on the pulmonary artery okay, to progressively raise the pulmonary artery pressure. Okay, associated with that, there is a right ventricular pressure increase that you see because you're putting a, a resistance on the pulmonary artery. Okay? And what he saw was the systemic pressures tolerate these kinds of changes for quite some time. And then it comes to a sudden crisis where with the rise in, in the pressure, there is an abrupt decline in your systemic pressure. And as a consequence, you're going to also see a interdependent uh, drop in your right ventricular pressures. And this kind of a process is something that he was trying to explain. Okay, And this is what he called as auto aggravation. So effectively, it works like this. So uh, you have either obstruction or other features, there is going to be some creation of a pressure overload. You can also have a right ventricular volume overload, but ultimately that is going to cause a right ventricular de uh, uh, decompensation, which means an enlargement of your right ventricular size. Remember, if your RV enlarges in terms of size, there is going to be, and there is an associated decline in your RV pressure, there is likely to occur or some degree of a, of a interdependence that is going to result in your left ventricular preload dropping. The septal shift and pericardial restriction can probably add to that. Okay, so when the left ventricular preload also drops, there is a likelihood that your coronary perfusion of the right ventricle can drop. And it is suggested that when this coronary perfusion becomes significant and creates an ischemia, you set off the vicious cycle of a progressive decline in the status. I have an argument that this is not necessarily the only mechanism, but there are even other mechanisms which may be something that we should consider. So broadly, the process of auto-aggravation is a the increasing systolic and, and diastolic interdependence that is creating a poorer and poorer, poorer left ventricular output along with a poorer coronary perfusion pressure, including of the right ventricle, which ultimately results in the decompensation of the patient. So how do we treat it? 
the treatment here focuses on three very specific issues. One, how well is the right heart preloaded or not? How well, not more than how well, is the right heart over preloaded, which is a strong possibility? Is there a major concern with the systolic interdependence? Can we improve that in some way? And is there an issue related to the afterload, many of which can be modified by the processes that you and I do in the, in the ICU, oxygenation, ventilation, the use of PEEP, and prone ventilation are the ways in which you can reduce it. I'll come back to that. So what is the issue about preload of the right heart in right heart failure? You understand very clearly that since the right heart failure is going to be associated with an overloading of the right heart, okay, there is going to be an increase in the right atrial pressures, okay? And that is also going to create a problem with your, uh, I, I said, no, I, I didn't mean RV filling. There's going to be a problem with your LV filling. And both of this probably needs to be taken into consideration. Everybody points out to this paper, okay? That is, I think, from uh, the French group, so somewhere in 1999, where they claim the uh, Mercat is the, basically the paper where they claim that in a patient who has hemodynamic compromise and right heart failure, an acute, this was an acute pulmonary embolism, I, I don't remember, okay? Uh, they claim that the administration of fluid was actually very good. The basis of that is this. Now, all these patients were given fluid. The baseline cardiac output was slightly lower than the average uh, cardiac output uh, after the fluid was administered. So the claim was you should go ahead and give fluid. It doesn't make sense physiologically. Because the right heart failure means that you're not pumping any blood out of the right heart. And if you add more fluid to the right heart, it doesn't cause it to, to pump more out, primarily because it can't eject out into the uh, high afterload that is already present. But as I said, the right ventricle has a very poor stalling response. Okay, And as your septum shifts, your left ventricle can actually get a lot worse. That this is not very logical. When you go back and look at the spine print of the same article, they'll only say that the best response in cardiac output is completely related to the chamber dimensions. The smaller the ventricle is, the more likely you will see this. And this is a problem over here. In most patients with cardiogenic shock related to right heart failure, the ventricle size is not small. It is usually quite large. And as a consequence, the administration of fluid is frankly illogical, irrespective of what these guys would say. I would probably be very careful in saying that in a patient with shock and right ventricular function, okay, they are already adequately preloaded and probably overloaded, that you shouldn't be giving them additional fluids. That is one thing that is of concern. So people always say, if the patient is stable, okay, oh, oh, before I go on to that, uh, just remember one of the classic paradoxes that you will see is in right ventricular failure, you also have a, a, a respiratory variation. People will usually look at this and say, oh, that is volume responsiveness. Be very careful. This is not because of the uh, sequential changes that you get with a volume unresponsive, I mean, volume underfilled patient, but this is typical of the, uh, what you call a, a parallel change. This is the vent ventricular interdependence that creates this problem. And if you give fluid to these patients, you potentially can hurt, hurt them rather than help them. So be very careful about giving the fluid. I would strongly recommend that you don't give fluids in these circumstances. People have always looked at the other side of the equation and said, what if I can give diuresis to reduce the right ventricular volume? If the logic is right ventricular fa failure is because of right ventricular volume distension, and that will cause an interdependence of the left ventricle. If I give a diuretic and empty out the right ventricle, wouldn't I be pushing the septum back into its position? And wouldn't it help in terms of the output that the patient will have? Also, it will reduce the venous back pressure, particularly to the liver and the kidney, and may also improve hepatorenal uh, condition. And this may be absolutely acceptable in chronic right heart failure in some situations where this may be a very significant concern. But in acute right heart failure, there is a serious problem. Uh, the one situation where this has been tested is in acute pulmonary embolism in patients who are hemodynamically stable. This is one randomized control trial, not an outcome study in terms of survival, but basically they looked to see if there was an improvement in the PESI score. They looked to see 
if giving a diuretic improves the heart rate, improves the systolic blood pressure, and improves the oxygenation. This theoretically can happen, right? If you give the diuretic, your right ventricular dimensions become smaller, your left ventricle contracts better, and as a consequence, it'll contract slower, it will generate a higher blood pressure, and will result in a better oxygen saturation in general. And what they said was, in this comparison where they gave placebo versus a 80 milligram Lasix bolus in about 256 patients, okay, they claimed that there was a greater benefit in the patients who given the diuretic. The primary outcome that they looked at was basically what happens to the urine output and what happens to these three parameters. Okay? And what they saw was the major reason that you had an improvement in this group was because the majority of them diuries very well. But there was an excess of patients who the heart rate went up in the diuretic group and the SBP and the arterial saturation didn't change. So really the other physiological parameters didn't change, but you made the patient pee a lot more. So what? Is that a test that we need to know when you give a diuretic? I don't know. Okay. So I'm not very convinced that there is a role for diuresis in acute pulmonary embolism at the present time. Okay. And I think while you may have logic and reasoning behind it, we don't have data to support its use in acute pulmonary embolism. Okay. The next aspect of it, as I said, was afterload, a reduction of the afterload. And the most common way in which we can reduce the afterload is through the processes that we take care of in the ICU. So classically, if you have hypoxia, you have hypoxic vasoconstriction. Hypoxic vasoconstriction causes your pulmonary artery pressures to go up. So provide them with oxygen, it will come down. Or improve their oxygenation, it will come down. The second aspect can be uh, you know, re related to the fact that when you're ventilating somebody, if you're using a very large kind of a tidal volume, it can cause major problems with your pulmonary artery pressure. So appropriate ventilation can be of benefit. Interestingly, the position of the patient, particularly seriously ill patients, okay, in a prone position also does wonders for the right ventricular function. As you can see over here, the RV-LV ratio comes down, eccentricity drops off, the tricuspid region, the regurgitation comes down, and your left ventricular function actually improves over a period of time. So all of that strongly suggesting that the right ventricle actually is benefited by something like proning. So much of what we do when we're talking about afterload changes in the ICU is the routine kind of processes that we apply in the ICU for the management of much of our ventilation. But at the same time, there may be occasional situations where we need to apply a more definitive therapy for the pulmonary vasodilation like the application of nitric oxide, which again has never been proven in a large enough study to show outcome differences, but definitely improves your pulmonary pressures. Okay, we can't, we can use probably some of the prostaglandins, but we can't use systemic vasodilators, like for instance, sildenafil may work on the pulmonary vessels, but at the same time can create moderately significant problems with your, uh, your systemic pressures also. And generally we don't focus so much on that. Just to, uh, hey, am, am I okay with my time, uh, Venkat Raman? Okay. Yes. I got, about, I got about another four minutes and I'll finish it. Yes, okay. sir. If the people online are still alive, uh, I, I will the, finish it. More than 200 people glued to it. No drop. Okay. Okay. So we'll unpeel them as, uh, when they're done with this. Okay. So this was something that is another fascinating kind of an approach. We said that patients who decompensate usually decompensate because of the ventricular interdependence causing a low right left-sided cardiac output because the septum is pushed in and the interdependence uh, related to systolic functioning also progressively comes down. And we said when that comes to a critical point, the coronary perfusion drops off and it sets off what you call your, your auto, uh, auto worsening. I, I'm forgetting the term. Okay. But effectively, somebody said, what if we do an experiment in which we keep an adequate maintenance of the coronary perfusion in a pulmonary hypertensive model? What they did in this situation was they applied a clamp like we saw in the, uh, in the Guiternian model to the pulmonary artery to increase your right ventricular failure. Okay, And they kept a coronary perfusion pressure that was going at a very standard rate by using an external pump, 
So there was no flow compromise in the coronary, uh, coronary uh, blood flow at all. And what they did as a process of neutralizing it was in the process of the heart failure becoming worse, they applied a progressive clamp on the aorta okay, to cause vasoconstriction. It's like providing a vasopressor therapy at the same time. And what they saw was absolutely fascinating that while you may think that the coronary flow may be uh, a, an issue that is leading to deterioration, you see a lot of the auto ag aggravation proceeding independent of the coronary flow. What they saw was when you apply a systemic pressure, say by the application of your aortic clamp, okay, you are actually pushing the septum back into a normal position by raising your left ventricular pressures. That's what they're showing over here, that when you put the aortic clamp, your ventricular dimensions come back to what you saw in your control in contrast to what you saw during the pulmonary hypertension. And they claim that this restoration of your septal dyskinesia, of your receptal position, improves the systolic interdependence that you have between the left ventricle and the right ventricle, and that actually causes an improvement in the patient's outcome, okay? Or the survival of this animal model is related to that. This becomes extremely important because the entire idea of the auto aggravation being related to a uh, coronary perfusion changes. So ultimately, while the initial mechanism may be exactly identical, the last component of it is the fact that there is an impaired systolic interdependence that causes a decompensation of the patient. And the application of a huge amount of vasoconstrictors would be reasonably logical. We recently had an acute pulmonary embolism where I had the patient almost on, oh, I don't remember the dosing, massive doses of both uh, system, uh, uh, what, what is this, uh, vasoconstrictors. Not and anymore. it was creating an improvement in her neurological function. Actually, she was more awake when we did that. So that is the broad issue. So just to quickly summarize what you do under hemodynamic support is remember, avoid fluid loading. And the idea about uh, diuresis is very questionable. The second aspect is reduce your raft load. And as I suggested, there are many ways in which, you, oh, I completely forgot about thrombolysis and thrombectomy. That will be the best way in which you can reduce your raft load in pulmonary embolism. Oxygen therapy, nitric oxide can be considered. Protective ventilation, including prone ventilation, is worthwhile. Levosimendin and sildenafil are probably very low in your, in your methods that you would use. I would probably focus on the first three or four very effectively. Additionally, as we suggested, the next aspect of it is to raise your systemic vascular pressures. Most typically, people would use inotropes. Inotropes can also benefit because by improving LV systolic function, the ventricular interdependence can actually get better. But generally, dobutamine has a huge vasodilatory property that anything that creates a vasodilation is potentially negative. If you create a systemic uh, drop in pressures, the septal shift and your cardiac output is going to be a lot worse. On the other hand, raising your systemic vascular pressure by the application of a vasopressor makes a lot more sense. So whenever I treat patients with hemodynamic uh, compromise, I use far less dobutamine and use far more noradrenaline or maybe even other uh, you know, combinations of vasoconstrictive aid for the management of the patient. This about summarizes what I had. And I think uh, that will be enough to torture most of you. Uh, <laughs> that is one hour and eight minutes. So if you have any questions and yes. you're still alive, you're very welcome to ask. I will stop my sharing right now. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. So it okay. was amazing. It was an amazing, sir. It was, uh, we could not actually see this uh, 68, 69 minutes passed on with those uh, lecture. And um, uh, there was no dropouts. That's a particular thing has happened over the last one hour and eight minutes. Sir, um, uh, coming back to this learning um, uh, RV function and RV failure, uh, in the intensive care time, in the critical care areas, as you mentioned, the typical um, uh, areas where you see acute RV failure, and we are more concerned about acute issues than the chronic issues, in which situations I will look for an RV dysfunction, and which will be the clinical clues which will tell me, please look at RV. Okay, very bro broadly, I mean, when you look at chronic RV failure, 
the parameters that we look at are what we traditionally call congestive failure signs, right? Patients with uh, significant fetal edema, abdominal ascites, uh, right heart enlargement, I mean, uh, hepatic uh, enlargement uh, and things like that. But very typically, uh, the way I would start worrying about a right heart failure is under the typical kind of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Our majority of our patients will be patients with either a primary pulmonary disease, either an acute kind of an event like a very severe pneumonia or ARDS, or on the other hand, they can be chronic lungs that can cause a deterioration. So one other group that I always find where you have significant right heart dysfunction is also in patients with chronic renal failure or on dialysis, a mechanism that is a little bit more complex to, to basically assess. And obviously, you will also try to focus on anybody with the left heart failure uh, and known coronary disease or left heart failure. So I don't see any reason for me to subdivide them. If there is a patient presenting to me with a hemodynamic compromise, or even in a relatively hemodynamically stable state where I worry about the potential for a coexistence of right heart failure, okay, I would probably go ahead and do a bedside echo. And remember, what I'm telling you is purely a bedside echo and a basic set of skills, RV to LV size, comparisons, um, uh, TAPSI that we need to be able to measure, septal flattening that we need to be able to see, CVP that we need to be able to measure. If you can do TR and if you can also do the pulmonary artery, lovely. If you can't, get someone to help you. That will not be of any value other than to watch the progression of the patient or the improvement of the patient with the treatment that you're providing. So this will be the kind of condition where I will start worrying about it. I think the whole lecture you summarized, Ki, you are more worried about not the contractility of the right heart, but the pressures against which it yes. forms. And also you are saying interdependency with the left ventricle, uh, that is probably the more important. And yes. in these situations, when there is a, also add-on uh, contractility issues with some infraction that may precipitate it more worse than what expected. Yes, absolutely. We know that, for instance, let's take the example of right heart failure, uh, right heart infarction. Right heart infarction, when it occurs as a pure RV infarct, that is your uh, reverse uh, leads uh, positive ST7 yeah. elevation, yeah. you're unlikely to see anything significant. If you most commonly, it is going to be associated with inferior wall MI, which can also be associated with septal dysfunction. Okay, so when you see an inferior wall MI and a right heart, in there, you worry about whether the right heart failure can create a problem. I didn't talk much about the management of that. That is a little different. In the right heart failure under those conditions, you can easily load the right heart a little bit so that the forward flow can be maintained between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery without compromising on the venous return to a great extent. And it can be done quite effectively. Okay, that is a little different in terms of the approach. The rest of it is focusing, as we say, on the uh, of the after load dominantly. And the interesting component of picking it up, you spoke about, uh, we are now slowly going out from the invasive PA catheters being used. And now we yeah. are seeing, talking about some correlation of this pressure measurement with an invasive line, uh, very well yeah. correlated. And uh, so uh, you, you spoke about the dimensions, you spoke about the TAPSI, you spoke about the PA uh, Dopplers, which can give you a clue. And uh, most of the times eyeball rolling will give you a clue in that way. So uh, yeah. what is the, uh, so we are slowly going away from PA catheter. Do you still believe, is there any role where these uh, cardiac cases or somewhere there is a PA catheter where okay. you have done some comparison? Very simple. The PA catheter is the gold standard. There's no question about it. For the measurement of your PA pressures, it is the gold standard. The only reason is gold standards are not uniformly applicable. That's the only reason. We call it a feasibility issue. Yes. If I was to take a routine ICU, non-cardiac non ICU, cardiac ICU, the availability of your PA catheter is going to be quite limited. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the ability to measure right heart pressures in that sense is going to be limited. And till the echo came, most of us were fumbling around. Literally, quite honestly, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't know right heart failure when it bit you. Okay. Uh, very, very, very clearly, there was a very serious concern. But remember, the PA catheter is still the gold standard. If somebody insists that they want to do it, they can do it. <clears throat> they will definitely get values that will be more meaningful than what you see. But still, the echo is far more intuitive. Okay, for the PA catheter to be effective, you need to do, have a, what, uh, you can't put in a routine PA catheter, you probably need to have a high response kind of a catheter so that you can estimate your right ventricular volumes, you can do all those kinds of additional things, you can play a lot of tricks and ultimately get it done. Uh, 
but it's not necessary. That's all I, I would argue. The echo is reasonably good. And again, the majority, about 60, maybe 70 to 80%, you can get a transthoracic, will be completely comfortable. A small subset, you might need a transesophageal. Again, yes. if that is not going to be a very routine kind of a skill that most of us will have, that will also be the problem of feasibility over there again. If it is available, it will add to the value of getting the diamonds in a better way? Which one? A TE. TE, uh, I can't think of too many ways in which it can add. One thing it can do, it can look at the pulmonary trunk better and cl closer. So if you're looking for something like a pulmonary embolism, you may be identify it on a TE more than you will identify it on a transthoracic. That may be the one factor. You may be able to identify a few other, uh, you know, atrial dimension changes that are a little bit better. But broadly, uh, as far as the quantitation of your pressures are concerned, it's not going to be very different. Really. And, uh, but, uh, pulmonary embolism may be occasionally a situation in uh, many of our ICUs, but the more common phenomenon is ARDS and the ventilation is yes, absolutely dysfunction. And you, you spoke about uh, the studies which has proven I, to actually drop. Yeah. drop the, I, no, just, just before I, you go on to that, I just uh, thought of something. Sir, when please. we have a patient with ARDS, and if you still believe in doing recruitment maneuvers, okay, remember that a recruitment maneuver on the short term raises your pulmonary pressures massively. And you can push the patient into significant RV failure. Okay. All right? And yeah. it is quite important under those circumstances for you to know what the patient's prior RV function was. And one of the things that I would say is if you're going to use things like recruitment maneuvers or very high peeps or anything like that, make sure that you assess the patient's right heart function because the approach, when you increase your airway pressures and the BP drops, you shouldn't be volume loading that patient at any point. You should be using vasopressors. Most of us in that kind of ARDS, anyway, we're too scared to use volume, okay? But effectively, that is a very important point that we need for that differentiation. So that is one routine issue. Sorry, I, I interrupted yeah, you on another yeah, So. So that's the area survey. Again, you added one more point saying ki the volume challenges which we give in them in a hemodynamically borderline patients, even though we were a little careful looking at the dynamic variables, other than other conditions like a low tidal volume, no arrhythmias, completely paralyzed and mechanically ventilated patient, the add-on thing you said, you look, look at the RV function. If you have a severe RV dysfunction, your volume responsive can be erroneous, even though you fit all the Absolutely. other Absolutely. Absolutely. You're completely right. Okay. Can I just take some of the panel questions that have been put yeah, yeah, over yeah. here? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will ask, yeah, sir, I'll ask those questions. So are yeah. we failure and shock? You will answer those questions. I'll ask those questions, sir. Yeah. So are we failure, are we failure and shock? And shock? Uh, what is yeah, the sequence of choice of vasopressor? You spoke about that with noradrenaline being your choice and you yeah. want to constrict systemic uh, vessels as much as possible. There was yeah. a question related to whether it is only NORAD or VASO together. How will you choose or you will also add adrenaline to that? Yeah, any, any vasoconstrictor can be completely acceptable. See, I don't know. There is no hard data on this. I'm extrapolating a physiological concept to the man. Okay, so generally I start NORAD. Okay, add vasopressin maybe at least to try and see if it can get an improvement transiently. Then additionally add uh, adrenaline. Sometimes uh, if you want to use vasoconstrictive doses of, uh, of uh, uh, what do you call it, dopamine also, as some people will add. I have used high-dose insulin as a mechanism of trying to maintain pressures like we use in refractory hypotensions. Okay. Particularly in we don't have glu no glucagon available, so we look at alternate mechanisms of maintaining the kind of output. So anything that I can do to keep the systemic pressures will be sequentially what I will add. There is no hard rule about which is the first one and which is the last one. My preference is like basic constrictors will be the, um, what do you call it? Starting from NORAD and then going the other way. Some the second I... question of the personal experience with Mildrenon infusion and RV dysfunction. It is an inodilator. It definitely has much better pulmonary artery pressure reduction effects than, than systemic, uh, than say dobutamine. There's a, the Doremi study, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, is a reasonable study uh, that looked at the, uh, the uh, comparative effects of dopamine versus, I mean, dobutamine versus uh, mildrenone effectively. Didn't show any dramatic difference other than the fact that they did see as a much better uh, pulmonary response that you will see. But remember, 
uh, it is an unforgiving vasodilatory kind of a drug. So the biggest problem with milrinone is if you drop your systemic pressures, you create a complete problem with the other side. Again, if you understand the physiology the way I am pushing the physiology, okay, and maybe it's a slight minority over here, I would feel a vasoconstrictive drug will be far more important than an inotropic drug, whether it is dobutamine or milrinone. Okay, if you're going to use dobutamine or milrinone, please make sure that you don't drop the pressures in parallel. Because if you do, you're going to have a serious problem. So how it means if I use a vasoconstrictor or a vasopressor in, uh, in, in the beginning or in the starting point and add dobutamine or ionodilator later? Very acceptable. You'll find what will happen, I, in my experience, invariably it will drop the pressure. You'll be sitting there regretting it. With dobutamine, it will be easy to turn it off. With milrinone, you'll be sweating your uh, whatever you... Uh, your head away, okay. Then, Effectively, that is going to be the bigger problem. This question, is just experience. Yeah, there is another question related to NTZ and NORAD in case uh, you said the, there will be volume stretch on the RV in case of embolism and they, they he wanted to talk about NTZ dropping your venous pressure and also using NORAD. So how it is in an unstable patient? It is quite I... complex. I, I don't know how to even answer. I can see the physiological reasoning that you have. For the same argument that you can have about diuretic therapy to unload the right ventricle and to improve the opposite side. But just remember, the biggest adverse effect that you're likely to have with nitroglycerin infusion is likely to be drops in systemic pressures that you can also have. And anything, I would always argue that trying to maintain systemic pressures are quite important for you to have any kind of a benefit in terms of your septal shifts and your a progressive improvement in your right heart function. So in balance, I've not tried it. It's actually quite an interesting thing. Uh, I use nitroglycerin as a preload reducer on a regular basis for other kinds of situations. But I have not. I I don't remember any data on this, nor have I had any experience with it. Yeah, Doctor Bharat, I will express the same way I told you. Um, I didn't exaggerate that, saying that this is one of the excellent presentation I ever had attended till now. But his question is related to the pulse pressure variation, which I actually was discussing with you. Yeah. Volume status and RV function. Yeah, I think we should emphasize that. Pulse pressure variations, if you measure it along with the respiratory variation, you can make a big differentiation between what is called an in-phase and out-of-phase kind of variation. An out-of-phase drop is usually what you see in hypovolemic patients, where after the initial rise in the airway pressures, there's a decline in the right heart filling that translates into a left heart output over several beats. So it usually occurs several beats after the airway pressure actually goes up. In contrast to that, what you see in right heart failure is when the right, right side of pressure goes up acutely, there is a septal shift that occurs at the same time, and that causes a left ventricular output to drop in parallel. Okay, And that is the true interdependence. It's a diastolic interdependence that we're talking since we don't record both our, our uh, ventilatory waves and our uh, respiratory mm -hmm. variation at the same time, we can misinterpret it. So when we just look at the pulse pressure variation, we don't have the respiratory pattern on. It's very important that you first assess your right heart function. If the right heart is not enlarged, you can presume it is volume responsive. There is one other uh, interesting thing that I would suggest, but probably at the risk of being uh, you know, extrapolating a little too much, is why can't you do a straight leg raising? If there is a straight leg raising response, even in a patient with right heart, that means there is an improvement in their output with fluid. But the only problem there is we can't make a judgment of how much fluid should be given because the patient may be responsive to 20 ml of fluid. And if you give them 500 ml of fluid, it may actually worsen this direction the other way around. So I generally find it a little difficult to make that differentiation. If you see, it is very important that when you see a respiratory variation, that you do an echo to see if your right heart is large or not. The yeah, role of IABP in RV function, you said there is a lot of interdependency, improve LV, RV will improve. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Again, remember IABP works not by uh, systolic pressure rises. It causes a afterload reduction. Okay, and potentially it can be adversely affecting your uh, your right heart function. Okay.
-hmm. there is some some data related to L words and things like that, which can cause the voicing right. of your right hand. Right yeah, words. Right ventricular yeah, assisting devices. No, I'm talking about left ventricular assisting devices itself creating a problem with your RV. Yeah. Okay. Always uh, uh, out of my league, please. Okay, I will not. Uh, it's, it's been 40 years since I worked in a cardiology lab. Okay, literally, not 40 years. Uh, yeah, almost 40 years. 1985, yeah. 85 is 40 years, right? So don't expect me to give you any answers on cardiovascular work. I did okay. my initial work in in a cardiology lab, so don't worry about it. Vex's score uh, role in uh, finding out. Venus interesting, and... interesting. Who's this genius who got that? Yeah, I think it is a great that. tool. Okay, and whoever it is, I, I praise you for thinking along those lines because that may be relevant in chronic right heart failure where you're worried about your organ dysfunction related to the high pressure loads. Okay, I don't know whether in a shocky patient whether you will have the courage enough to be either fluid restrict restrictive or diuresing the patient. That's what I showed you in that initial yeah. trials and pulmonary embolism it is not so successful. Please remember, the treatment of chronic right heart failure has a little bit of subtlety that is a little different. The focus on using a lot more diuretic and fluid restriction is, is much more logical under those circumstances than under the acute circumstances. So I'd be very careful, but it's a fascinating idea. I don't think anybody has looked at it uh, seriously enough, but I think it's a great tool. Uh, so if you, nobody doing... knows what Bexus is, you might want to explain it very quickly. That it's basically uh, what venous uh, congestion kind of uh, parameters by by bedside echo, bedside uh, ultrasound. Ultrasound of different organ systems, maybe. Yeah, effectively. Mm -hmm. So there was another interesting question related to right uh, heart failure related to infeval MI. And the conventional teaching is you can give a uh, volume challenge, but as you said, it's a low compliant, a highly compliant um, uh, the contractility will not be off uh, with the stretch where you found Frank no, 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 let, let me just explain the right ventricular infarction. Okay. Right ventricular infarction is a compromise of your purely of your right ventricular free wall. We're not talking about RV infarction with inferior wall MI. Under those circumstances, the output need not be very significantly compromised unless there is mild elevations in your pulmonary hypertension. Okay. Yeah. And very often when you have shock in right ventricular failure, it is not because of pure RV infarction alone, but associated septal or left ventricular infarction also at the same time. And when you have such a situation, you need to overcome the slightly elevated pulmonary hypertension on the other side without the contractility helping. And one of the ways in which you can do it is by raising a pressure gradient that is sufficiently large not to prevent venous return from occurring, but sufficiently large for you to empty it out forward into the, into the pulmonary vasculature. And that is the reasoning behind the administration of fluid in right ventricular infarcts. Okay? But if you have a right ventricular infarct along with an LV infarct or a septal infarct, you need an inotropic agent or something like that to additionally support the left ventricular function for you to show an improvement. I think people should recognize that. So the, common, the, the common causes you spoke about being uh, embolism and uh, sepsis or something like mechanical ventilation in a severe yeah. RV dysfunction. So yeah. he was trying to know any other conditions. Um, I think most common were them. Any other condition where I can get a severe hypotension with severe RV dysfunction. Severe hypotension with RV dysfunction. I can't think of too many other situations. Classically, that... it will be afterload increases very classically, mm -hmm. or in the face of a wider cardiogenic shock with the LV failure also at the same time. I can't think of too many other situations. Where I... Peep titration in RV failure, uh, uh, like in... Very difficult, okay? Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether you're all very familiar with the so-called Wittenberger curve, right? Yeah. Which is the pulmonary artery pressures which change with the tidal volumes and the airway pressures that you apply. And that curve is a U-shaped curve, okay? At very low pressures, it probably will be very high pulmonary pressures. At very high uh, airway pressures, again, it can be very high. Somewhere in between, it will be ideal. And unfortunately, we can't measure pulmonary vascular resistance for us to know. So dominantly, when you put somebody on ventilation, and in fact, I would worry about it. When I put somebody who's hypoxic and has a pulmonary embolism, we have a big tendency to put them on non-invasive ventilation. 
we have no way of titrating it effectively. Okay, so we don't know whether you will cause a deterioration or a worsening or an improvement. Very difficult. We can't measure your pulmonary vascular resistance appropriately. Uh, there again, you could do it if you had, say, a pulmonary artery catheter. Okay, uh, but you can't measure your um, pulmonary vascular resistance in a in a strict way. And as a consequence, you probably will be, you know, titrating it up or down will be problematic. But there are simple rules that we can take in that. Number one, large tidal volumes are terrible. So do not give large tidal volumes because that can cause a vascular compression. Number two, very high peeps will also be terrible. So if you're going to titrate anything in, in peep, you're using your oxygenation as your index, I would be very scared of using anything more than 10 or 12 of peep in a patient with a pulmonary embolism. Okay. Um, that will be the kind of approach that I will have. Okay. But it's in very ARDS, difficult. In ARDS, the question is related to the ARDS. In ARDS, my suggestion is the one thing that helps your pulmonary artery pressures lovely in the best way is would prone. be to put the patient prone. prone. Okay. So I thought of two things. I'll put a low tidal volume. I'll keep a peep at the low pressure kind of a range and then flip the patient around. Okay. That will be my method. Now, that's why I threw in that slide yes. because it's a fascinating slide. It's yes. actually a yes. very effective kind of very. reduction in PA pressures. And uh, it actually improves not just RV, but LV function as you saw. Okay. Yes, through the interdependence, completely through the interdependence. And yes. you will see how many patients you turn prone and their hemodynamics, which is sort yes. of marginal, yes. improves. Yes. It does improve. Yeah. So that yeah. question related to... Uh... Anything hey, the same question? I've gone through one and a half hours. I think people will be nauseated <laughs> by me continuing to say yes, anything. I think more. most of them are covered. ICMO role, uh, maybe one uh, area which you can actually just oh, leave me at ICMO. ICMO, I, I, ICMO as a role. <laughs> in ICMO will leave it to the cardiovascular teams. Yeah, we'll leave it to some other discussion. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much. It's a uh, thank you. One and a half hour. It's yeah. so many questions popping up still now. <laughs> And all of them are still glowing, sir. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and honor to be here, sir. And uh, uh, hope, thank you uh, for inviting me. I, <laughs> I've been talking continuously on right heart, right heart function. I'm slowly getting better, probably yes. because I'm understanding it a little bit better as I give each yes, presentation. And, uh, many of us uh, has a learning experience today, sir. It's all wisdom and a combination of many clinical experience. Thank you, sir. I can okay, thank you. Thank all the participants. And all those who are actively participating and asking questions, it's always an amazing feeling when you have interaction and students being awake and <laughs> interacting. Yeah, the 8.30 8 is a little too early. Nobody should fall asleep. Okay. <laughs> no, they were awake in the classroom. <laughs> I mean to say. Okay. I got uh, Dr. Santosh, you were the one who asked on Vexus score. I, yeah. I appreciate that. And I think it's about time that you go and read about it. And maybe the next presentation should be on Vexus score. Yes, sir. done. Thank you, sir. Thank Very you, and I conclude the session. Fascinating. Yeah, thank you for your lovely input, all you guys. I mean, uh, it's always a pleasure to teach to somebody who's receptive. Yes. Unfortunately, when you're doing it online, you can't look at your faces. I would have loved to see your faces. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank next you very much for coming with this time. students. Next time we'll come with students, sir, uh, so that it will be an interactive case. Yeah. Any, thank any you. Thank you very advice, much. Any of your choice, sir, where you will want to take a case of uh, some some of your case case discussion, where you would like to take one of the cases, any case you want. Yeah, tell me later. We can discuss it offline. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Bye.